Cubism began in the early 20th century, but it still influences people today. It was started by Picasso and Brock. They were the fathers of Cubism. When Cubism first began, it was highly rejected because people thought it was ugly and they couldn't really understand it. Uh, Henry Matisse came up with the name in 1909 because he said the pictures are made of nothing but little cubes, and the name kind of stuck from there. And some of the characteristics of Cubism are the harsh lines, the monochromatic color schemes, and there's overlapping planes. There's also angular shapes of normally round objects. And you can see different perspectives at the same time. Cubists have the same ideas that Impressionists and Post-Impressionists had. They both wanted to show 3D forms in their work. Impressionists did this with colors, and Barack and Picasso did this with geometric shapes. They also completed these ideas in a more radical expression. Paul Serusier was claimed to be the father of Cubism, but he misunderstood the essentials of Cubism, along with Raymond de Chorlier. They said it was simpler forms of flat geometry and laws of mathematical construction. Paul Cezanne was a major influence on Cubism because of his focus on forms and shapes, specifically cubes, cylinders, and spheres. Cubism is said to be Cezanne taken to the extreme. <laughs> Cezanne is often said to have laid the artistic groundwork for the birth of Cubism because of his ideas on shapes and reducing the importance of the subject, both which are important in Cubism. Now here's a fun fact. Pablo Picasso was actually so inspired by Paul Cezanne that he bought the property on the mountains where Cezanne often painted. Did you know Picasso was actually buried there? What? No way! Cubists were inspired by the Wright brothers' first successful human flight. It changed the way people, including Picasso and Brock, thought about movement. They also were inspired by Carl Jung's theories about the unconscious and the human psyche and by using colors that would cause certain emotions. Picasso created Cubism in response to the changes in science, specifically about space and time. They also were inspired by major... major technology advances like the assembly line, escalator, New York subway, and they were inspired by African tribal maps. Many people might think that there is some kind of deeper meaning to their paintings, but none of the Cubist painters had any philosophical training that would lead to any possible parallels. In the creation of the working class caused the general public, not just the really wealthy, to demand art, so it was an opportunity to explore new ideas and techniques. Pablo Picasso said, I paint objects as I think them, not as I see them. Cubists wanted to show the two-dimensionality of the canvas they were using. They used contrast and shallow space to emphasize this. They also abandoned light and used monochromatic colors as to not draw attention away from the point of the painting itself, the structure of form. When artists paint humans, they often have different viewpoints of the face. Because humans make different expressions. Essential of Cubism was outline, volume, and color so they got rid of atmosphere and relative distance. When looking at the subject, you can often see multiple fragments, including different viewpoints of the objects. The artists did this because they wanted to show that in the natural world, the subjects actually move themselves. After being inspired by Cezanne like Brock and Picasso were, Duchamp started using ochre and brown in his work before he even did cubist art. Duchamp's piece, Nude Descending a Staircase, used cubist shapes and a person with five movements layered on top of each other to create movement. We've all seen this picture before when we discussed Marcel Duchamp and Duchamp Day in the beginning of the year. You can see how this is cubist through like the colors with the monochromatic color sch scheme and the brownish and tan colors. And that you can also see he was trying to show movement of the figure walking down the stairs because it's broken up into multiple different frames. Yeah, I think there's actually like five planes. There's like the first one in the very beginning, and then there's like three in the middle that kind of blend together, and then there's the last one, and you can like see its legs. They're like moving. Yeah. Cubism can be broken up into two different sections, analytical and synthetic cubism. Analytical was the first period, and synthetic was the second. They started using different mediums and materials in synthetic cubism. Uh, you can see this with Duchamp using this with ready-mades. In analytical cubism, it was composed of basic geometric forms and was usually two-dimensional. Often the background tends to dissolve, leaving only the geometric shapes. Subject matter of the cubist paintings were often objects of still life, such as musical instruments, bottles, glasses, and newspapers. 
because it was easier to deal with simple things since they focused so much on form. This then made it easier for the spectator to interpret. They also painted people, but they rarely painted landscapes. This was because the Cubists didn't like the idea that art should copy nature or any traditional techniques. Maurice Dennis said, One should not copy or reproduce nature as one sees it, but represent it by transforming it into an interplay of vivid colors set out in a simple, expressive, and original arabesque, which is pleasing to the eye. This meant a return to the flat colors of the religious print and the tuppence colored, to the hierarchic attitudes of the Egyptians, the Byzantines, and the Roman frescoes, to the art of childlike peoples. The poet Apollinaire was really good friends with Picasso and Braque. He said, The art of painting original arrangements composed of elements taken from conceived rather than perceived reality about cubism. Forms are generally compact and dense in the center of analytical cubist paintings. They grow larger as they move towards the edges of the canvas. In analytical cubism, shape and space melted into one another to make one thing made out of many intersected and overlapped surfaces. Picasso and Brack didn't just paint one perspective. They layered views from other angles so that you could see the subject from all sides. Compared to analytical cubism, synthetic cubism is simpler, brighter, and bolder. Synthetic cubism is made with new materials like cardboard, paper, sand, sawdust, craft tools, razor blades, and metal shavings. They also incorporated letters, words, and even numbers into their paintings. Brock especially liked to use the wood grain effect. In synthetic cubism, artists made pieces that showed experiences a person might have in urban life and in public space. It does this by bringing together shapes and forms to give people that sense. In synthetic cubism, cubists broke the second dimension by using materials like paper and fabric in their paintings. This gave a, a different relationship between the viewer and the painting because the viewer could get a sense that there was no limits or boundaries. Before cubism, a person could walk up to a painting and instantly know the subject, since it was pre presented to the viewer very easily. But cubists changed it so that a person had to search or decode the image to find what the subject was, using signs. Because Brock and Picasso painted objects so different than what people were used to seeing, people sometimes couldn't recognize the subjects or they didn't, weren't getting the correct emotions and ideas from their work. To solve this problem, they made signs, which was creating semi-abstract signs to show the main point of the painting. They got this idea from symbolism and the importance of the metaphor. It has been said that Cubism was the most important movement of the 20th century and marked the birth of abstract art. Brock and Picasso met in 1906 and became friends. In 1907, Picasso invited Brock to his studio, where Picasso showed him Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, which caused Brock to start creating the same type of art. After seeing a painting by Brock, the French artist Louis Vassel first used the term cubism, or bizarre cubique. Brock explained his very close relationship with Pablo Picasso by saying, Those years, Picasso and I said things to each other that nobody will ever say again that nobody would know how to understand ever again. It was a little like being roped together, climbing a mountain. Although Picasso denied the connection to African tribal masks and his paintings, in some of his work you can clearly see the relation. The first Cubist painting by Picasso, Les Demoiselles de Avignon, was painted after he saw some African art when he visited Paris. It is said that Cubism was born in the right half of his painting. So this painting by Picasso was basically the start of Cubism. It was painted in 1907 and took about nine months to complete. It's not considered his first true Cubist work of art, but it was the beginning of it. His first true Cubist work of art is Head of Ferdinand. Picasso actually did a lot of planning and preparation for Les Demoiselles de Avignon. If Picasso had stopped at any one of his early sketches, which showed all the figures having curved and normal bodies, then cubism probably never would have happened. Picasso decided to geometricize everything, including the figures in the background. He was unhappy with it and made changes for it to months. The figure crouching down and the figure above her, both, you can see the African tribal masks influences by the shape of their faces and how it's broken up. Each figure is drawn differently, like. Their positioning and the shading is all different in each one. And you can see they have like bold and apprehensive faces and they're all actually staring at the viewer. And there's uh, a feel of sexual anxiety. 
Picasso was very interested in human anatomy and was constantly looking for new ways to draw human bodies. You can see how it's gearing towards cubism because of the shape of their bodies and how it's broken up. It's very angular, especially the background is like almost into cubes, but not quite. The shape of the body is very cubist too because it's like broken up into different like shapes. It's not all like one person. You can see like different shapes in the body like rectangles and cubes and triangles, cylinders. The movement in this painting might have been influenced by some of the technological advances in this era like the opening of the New York subway or the invention of the escalator. And back to the colors, um, comparing Picasso to Cezanne. The warm reddish browns kind of represented the advancing and the cool blues were like receding just like Suzanne had done. So on like the left side you and the background you can kind of see like the reddish brown and then farther on the right you can see the coolish blue color. So this is a sculpture that Picasso made in 1909 and it's called Head of Fernand. And the subject is Picasso's lover at the time and he often painted his lovers like Marjolie had the subject of another one of his lovers. <laughs> And this one was Fernand Oliver. Oliver. Her real name was Amelie. <laughs> he made this like right before they broke up, so you can kind of see like the strain in their relationship on the sculpture, because it doesn't look like as pretty as of her like as it could be. <laughs> and this made Picasso realize he could translate three dimensions in one painting, so it was key to the development of Cubism. The head looks different from every angle you look at it, so it also kind of has that, like, thing of cubism about how, like, you can see different angles and different viewpoints all in one. Okay, this painting is called Marjoli by Pablo Picasso, and it's a portrait of his lover at the time, Marcel Humbert. In French, it means my pretty girl. And at the bottom center, it says Marjoli in big black lettering which is the characteristic they used in synthetic cubism. This is also another example of the monochromatic coloring with the tan, brown, black, and yellow colors. The broken up planes and how everything is basically made up of smaller shapes also show characteristics of cubism. To the right of the module lettering is a small music note. And above the lettering it looks like an arm is there, and then also far, farther up is a clenched fist. Um, near the bottom, on the right side, is another hand, or it could be possibly a foot, depending on how you look at it. And this is an example of signs without the little hints of the arm and the clenched fist. The viewer would not be able to tell what the subject of the painting is, and it actually is a woman. Near the bottom on the left side, it looks like a violin that's also slightly broken up. So he uses violins a lot like, in his paintings. Like, like Juan Gris. Yeah. Too. They like violins a lot. They use yeah. them in basically like every painting. <laughs> this painting is by Picasso, and it's called Still Life with a Chair Caning. And it's one of the first of Picasso's collages, which means that different materials were used. Uh, he used like the different materials as the wax cloth for the illusion of the chair caning and then the rope is framing the piece and then there's also pasted paper that's on there as well. And this is another example of the use of lettering that synthetic cubism has with the J-O-U letters on the upper left side. There's rope surrounding the art piece which shows like the mixed media used in synthetic cubism again. And there's also a rope pattern which represents the chair caning. Uh, I like around, like if it was a clock, at about like 2 o'clock on the right edge of the painting is the handle of a knife. And then the blade is a little farther to the right, like if you follow down the edge. And the handle of the knife is cutting a fruit, possibly a lemon or an orange. You can see the rind of the fruit and the sections of it. On the top of the chair caning is a glass bowl. It's kind of difficult to see because he showed the bowl from a lot of different angles and they're all like layered on top of each other, so it's difficult to see what it is, but it's a glass bowl. And about this painting, he said that he used the colors like features to follow the changes of the emotions. Picasso used shapes like cones and cylinders as the base for his ideas about composition. This painting is called Three Musicians by Pablo Picasso. and it's synthetic cubism 
and the people are made up of cubes and rectangles and are broken up into pieces and parts of that are also made up of paper cutouts. And the figures blend together so you can't really see where one ends and another begins. Like the blue part of the first musician's stomach is attached to the second musician's eyes. <laughs> and the first mu musician is playing what seems to be a clarinet. The second musician is playing a guitar, and the third is playing a keyboard or maybe holding a sheet of music. Beneath the musician is a dog. You can't see its head since it's covered by the first guy's leg, but you can see its paws and the rest of its body. And this doesn't use the monochromatic color scheme like his other cubist paintings. He actually uses Cezanne's colors, which are fractured angular shapes, and the warm reddish browns are advancing and the cool blues are receding. So that's why he didn't use the monochromatic color scheme like all his other paintings. When Brock saw Les Demoiselles de Avignon, he called it a loss for a French painting, but the idea of the new perspective caused Brock to join the movement. Picasso and Brock were unique to other Cubist artists since they didn't begin with the image, but rather created one out of colors and shading. They began creating square rectangular planes with curves for objects, like glass, which was very difficult to do. Picasso and Brock would sign the back of their paintings instead of in the bottom corner of their paintings um, to make it a mystery as to who the artist was because they were so alike. Brock has been quoted saying, Cubism's main direction was the materialization of space. Brock studied effects of light and perspectives and how painters represent them. He creates visual dynamics through balance of, by shapes and colors, making the paintings pleasing to the eye. Brock once said, in order to avoid a recession towards infinity, I began superimposing planes over one over the other, separated by slight distances, to make the viewer understand that things stand one in front of the other rather than going back into space. Brock is credited for coming up with the idea of the collage, which is piecing together, making it stand out through other materials. Brock said, when fragmented objects appeared in my paintings around 1909, it was a way for me to get as close as possible to the object as the painting allowed. This is a painting by Brock called Road Near Lestock, and it was a painting he did uh, before Cubism. It's the same landscape that Paul Cezanne often painted, and like, you can see that how the shapes and the planes are tilted led to Cubism because of the crowded space and the color palette and the sharp geometric forms. And it's not a traditional landscape, it's more like the landscape is the subject itself, but the parts are changed to be more abstract. Okay, so Brock was heavily influenced by Suzanne, and he really focused on developing his ideas of multiple perspectives. And you can also see he was influenced by Suzanne by the volumes of the houses and the cylindrical forms of the trees, and he also has the tan and green color scheme. There's like progressive graduations of color in the color scheme and it like flattened in accessible spaces and some areas of the canvas were unpainted like Suzanne did, like the tree trunks, some of it is left unpainted. Suzanne's work has been imitated before but without any comprehension. He can now be understood through Cubism. This is Still Life with the Violin by Brock and it was made in 1912 and it is part of the synthetic Cubism period. It has a monochromatic color scheme, a lot like all the other Cubist paintings with like the orangey colors and like tans. <laughs> and because it's synthetic Cubism, he used the wood grain technique that he likes to use a lot. And some of the violin is done with this, but another part is not. The violin is broken up, especially with the center part of the strings being shown in three different places. One is more near the top, and then another is like a little farther down, and the last part is like a little farther south in the center of like the work of art. And the subject of this piece is a violin, which is included in a lot of other Cubist art pieces, especially in pieces by Brock and Picasso. And they, yeah, they did this because they really like musical instruments and enjoy listening to music, so they kind of show that a lot in a lot of their art. Um, this piece has the harsh lines and fragmented forms and objects are shown from different perspectives all at the same time, and the complex forms are often found in cubist pieces. Picasso and Brock both painted a lot of still lifes, which is like like a still life with a chair caning by Picasso and still life on a table with Gillette, but eventually they stopped painting still lifes, 
and during still lifes they had like their objects right in front of them to paint but they also began painting from imagination rather than just from like the objects they had in front of them so it kind of made everything look more abstract. So this one is a lot like Juan Gris' violin and guitar with the neck of the violin being broken up in a different spot. Yeah. This is called Still Life on a Table with Gillette. It was made by Brock in 1914 and it's synthetic cubism. He used pasted paper on this piece along with charcoal which makes it synthetic. And this is another Still Life like Still Life with the chair caning by Picasso. It's also another example of how Brock uses the wood grain technique. And on the bottom underneath the wood is sketches. And then on top of like the sketches are the wood and these like almost like newspaper type things that say words like Gillette, Dory, Chow, and Tarnes. Mm -hmm. um, there's also like a black organic shape to the right of the wood pieces. Um, there are it's not monochromatic colors. There are a lot of white and organic black shapes, which draws your eye to it because of the contrast of color and shape since everything else is geometric. This painting is called Fruit Dish, Ace of Clubs by Brock. It was made in 1913 and it's synthetic cubism. It uses the wood grain technique also in this painting. There's also the letters LE are used, which are stenciled below the wood piece on the right side. And there's pictures of grapes on the top center, which are part of the fruit dish itself. And there's also two playing cards. There's a card of hearts and a card of clubs, which refers to the ace of clubs in the title. The subjects are broken up and shifted, so the planes are overlapping. It also has a monochromatic color scheme uh, with shades of tan, gray, and black. This is another painting by Barack called The Portuguese. It was painted in 1911. and in it, he uses words and numbers to make the viewer aware that the surface of the painting is just as important as what is put on top of it, or to make the viewer aware of the canvas itself. So you can see like the letters like on the top right corner, it has the letters D, B, A, L, and some people think that that stands for grand ball, but like the other words are cut off. Um, so on the middle bottom part of the painting is part of a guitar that's been broken up into smaller pieces. And there's also like the monochromatic color scheme with the lighter and darker shades of tan. It shows one subject from many different angles and views all layered on top of each other like they did a lot during cubism. This painting is called Violin and Candlestick. It's by Brock. Um, he wanted to develop cubism into something that rather than just seeing a picture of something, you could be able to like touch things. Um, this painting shows uh, the monochromatic colors with the tans and grays like most cubist paintings have. It's very, in the very center, it's really difficult to see because it's really broken up, but it tries to show the different viewpoints and angles, but it's like a candlestick in the center. And below the candlestick, a little to the left, is part of a violin, which is slightly broken up. And then to the right of the biggest part of the violin is the little like bow thing that they play, that the violinist used to play the violin. And you can really see the influence of movement in this picture. The planes and all the objects are really broken up and lots of different angles are being shown. So this painting looks a lot like other paintings that Brack and Picasso both did, and that's because they often painted side by side. So a lot of their paintings are really similar, especially like they look really similar with the color scheme being the same. Juan Gris first started with analytical cubism, but moved to synthetic cubism after 1913. He thought that the artist should recreate and reinterpret the subject of his painting. He did this by reinventing our daily objects, picking them apart one by one, all to reassemble them. He used many different materials in his work, like collage, paint, and charcoal. While Picasso and Brack used more monochromatical colors, Gris used bright harmonious colors, much like Matisse. Juan Gris studied mechanical drawing, which may have helped or contributed with his painting career. He was friends with Matisse, Brock, Leisure, and Picasso. He painted a portrait of Picasso, which was significant at this time because it was a cubist piece painted by someone other than Picasso or Brock. Uh, this painting is by Juan Gris, and it is a portrait of Pablo Picasso, and it's analytic cubism with its uh, deconstruction and simultaneous viewpoint of objects. 
You can see the monochromatic color scheme in this again. Greece doesn't usually stick with the traditional color scheme of many other cubists like Picasso and Brock. So this is one of his few paintings that actually has that color scheme. Like a lot of his other ones, he has like brighter colors, like primary colors like red and blue and green. And the background planes in this are broken up into different shapes like rectangles. The actual body of Picasso, while it's still cubist, it's also like slightly normal as well because it's really easy to tell what it is. But it's broken up, but it only shows the angles a couple different times. And there are two sets of shoulders. Um, one pair is lower and another pair is higher up. And it's also angled slightly different, showing the shoulders from two different viewpoints at the same time. The face is extremely broken up and the planes are all overlapping and shifted on top of each other. This painting also makes uh, Picasso look really like fat kind of, <laughs> and but he isn't, it's just like the way that uh, like Greece like did the angles on top of each other. It just makes him look like he has like more of like a stomach than he really does. There's also an inscription at the bottom of the painting and it says uh, homage a Pablo Picasso, which shows Greece's respect for Picasso as a leader of Cubism. Uh, this painting is called Violin and Guitar by Juan Gris. And this painting does not use monochromatic colors like most paintings do. Instead, it has these bright blues, greens, reds, and purples. On the upper part of the painting, it shows the neck part of the violin in three different ways. They're all like different angles and from different viewpoints, and they're all like on overlapping planes. And the neck of the guitar is located a little farther to the right of the guitar. It's broken up into two main parts that are both on different angles. On the bottom of the painting is the guitar, but like the rest of the painting, it's broken up and shifted and shown from many angles, overlapping all at the same time. This is like uh, basically like a normal cubist painting except for the colors. Now here's the fun fact. Juan Gris's most expensive painting is currently Violin and Guitar, which sold in 2010 for 28.6 million U.S. dollars. This painting is another one by Juan Gris. It's called Violin and Glass. And again, he didn't use monochromatic colors. It has shades of green, black, white. It has some tan and brown, but a lot of it's like green. The background of the green looks like it might be wallpaper, and it literally looks like a piece of it was picked up and moved forward and a little to the left. The image of the violin is very interesting as well because it's different than like other cubist paintings of violins have been. Like The violin in this painting is very close up, so you can really see the detail of the strings and the wood patterns. In other ones, it's like more farther back. It's not, you don't get like as of a close up view of the violin. And the top of the neck of the violin is located right about the move wallpaper part and the main part of the violin is in the center very close up and broken up and shifted to show many different angles and viewpoints of the same violin. There's also a piece of sheet music that seems to be broken up and shifted around a little bit. It's like a little bit below the violin on like what looks like to be a table. And there's also a piece of glass that is possibly filled with wine that's located to the right of the sheet music, and it's broken up by a couple of viewpoints as well. Fernand Lager went to school for architecture, so that helped with geometric forms in his cubist paintings. He also fought in World War I, and through that became very interested in mechanical forms. He founded what is now called Tubism after working more closely with cubism. Lager worked with paint, film, ceramics, glass, print, large-scale murals, books, art, theater, and dance sets. He also used cylinders, cones, and gears in his paintings to create robotic-like figures. He wanted to express noise and speed of new technology and machinery, so he would work through several themes of, or cycles. This painting is called The Bridge and the Tugboat by Fernand Lager. And as you can see, it doesn't have the traditional monochromatic color scheme which is like the grays and the browns, but instead it uses lots of grays and greens and yellows and reds. The subject of this painting, which is the boat, is broken up and it's like overlapped a lot, which also is painted in lots of different colors. And this has the overlapping planes and different viewpoints of the same object at different angles, but instead of making the objects more cube-like, Lager made them more round. Um, he actually fought in World War I where he got injured while fighting and he didn't like that so when World War II broke out he moved to America 
and then after World War II was over, he moved back to France and became a communist. And you can see like the influence of that in some of his paintings. And but during when he his time in World War One, he was really inspired by the gears and other mechanical technologies. And you can see the influence of that in his paintings, since everything is more round, almost like a gear or like mechanical tubing. And Lager was also involved in another art movement that stemmed from Cubism called Orphism and Tubism. This is a tubist piece by Fernand Lager, and there are actually a couple different pieces of his that are also called Contrast to Form, but this specific one was done in 1913. Uh, this does not have the monochromatic color scheme that like most cubist pieces have, but instead it uses like oranges, reds, blues, and tan colors. And you can see the different angles and viewpoints of the tubes shifted on top of each other. On the tubes, you can tell how it's shifted by the reflection of the light source being shifted onto the tubes. Instead of everything being reduced to cubes, like in cubism, everything is reduced to what looks like tubes. And you can also see his inspiration of the gears in this painting as well, since the shape of everything is similar to a gear. Fernand Lager was different from other cubist painters because he preferred primary colors instead of monochrome colors. He also depicted humans or abstract objects in action to convey the movement of daily life. His geometric systems seemed to form patterns and his shapes floated in space rather than converging like the other cubist paintings. Because of the way he went about constructing his art with colors and shapes, his paintings were close to abstractionism. Okay, this is the card players done by Lager in 1917 and it's from an art movement called Futurism, and the color scheme is not monochromatic. It has lots of silvers and grays with some blues, reds, and shades of yellow and orange. Uh, Suzanne has a painting called The Card Player as well, so it could be like influenced from his painting and named after that. And you can see the different body parts are separated from each other, so it, it is hard to tell which arm belongs to whom. The people are also shown from many different angles all at the same time. You can see this from where the light hits the arms. Like, from where the light source would be is different in some spots. Like, it looks like the light source has changed, but it really hasn't. It's just that the artist, like, shifted the, like, arm or whatever body part. So, like, on the arms on the right side, the light is reflected on the left side, but on the arms farther back, it makes it seem like the light source has moved so that the reflection of the light is toward the viewer on the front of the arm. And the people playing the cards look like robots, which could possibly be a statement about his communist ideals rather than on form, but it's also inspired by his interest in mechanics, and their body parts are rounded instead of cubes like they would be in normal cubism. This painting is called The Big Black Divers. It's done by Leisure in 1944. Leisure! Leisure in 1944. <laughs> We're not really sure of the art form because when we looked it up, it like some people said that it was cubism, some said it was tubism, but we know for sure it's not cubism. And this is because um, it doesn't have like the monochrome colors. It has like lots of bright colors. And it's also not tube-like. It's or like broken up, showing different planes or perspectives. The bodies are just all kind of like mushed together. Yeah, you can't really like see different perspectives on it. They're all just like. Or like laying in a mosh pit or something. Yeah, and like the figures are more round and there's not really any harsh lines like there is in normal cubism. Yeah. And he introduced a new technique in this painting which was to outline separate from the colors and it had like blocks of color that aren't outlined and so he used this technique in a lot of his later works as well. Yeah, like the, the figures, like they have like different colors but they're all outlined in the black. Yeah. So it's like, why you do that, Leisure? Cubism also had an influence on sculpture and architecture. The Wiseman Art Museum and the Notre Dame de Haute Chapel were inspired by cubism. The geometric and fragmented shapes are very similar to analytical cubism. Not only were there cubist paintings, but there were also cubist sculptures. One sculptor, Jacques Lipschitz, made cubist-inspired sculptures that were broken into geometric shapes and had multiple planes, which caused your eyes to move from background to foreground. Eugenio Requenzo was inspired by Picasso's cubist paintings to create photography of models bringing Picasso's paintings to life. In the photographs, the models are positioned just like Picasso's paintings. Their faces are also painted to look like the girls in the painting. Cubism had big influences on surrealism, dada, and abstractionism.
It ended up being one of the primary influences on most or all abstract art before World War II. Many surrealists like Picasso's piece Woman with Chemise in an Armchair, and some were inspired by the shape of the woman's body parts. Robert Delaunay founded Orphism, which was inspired by Cubism and known as Orphic Cubism. In 1911, Futurism was developed and inspired by synthetic Cubism collages.